Sorry, I'm a bit late. <laughs> Hi. Uh, well, thanks for coming to this seminar intersection organized by um, the Klima uh, Laboratory. And um, yeah, so uh, today we're going to uh, listen to a speech paper by. Uh, I'm going to introduce um, him to you now. And uh, sorry, I'm a bit out of breath because I, I ran from one uh, course to here. Um, but yeah, so Johan Luca is a senior lecturer at Université Rouen Normandie. And uh, he's a member of the research unit Equipe de Recherche Interdisciplinaire uh, sur les Aires Culturelles, also known as ERIAC. Um, his research has focused on uh, African American cultural magazines and literary anthologies uh, from the Harlem Renaissance and the Black Arts Movement, especially on the incidence of these publications. Oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so on the incidence of these publications on the canon formation processes of the African American literature. So today's paper is entitled, um, and I'm reading from your, uh, <laughs> Laptop, so Building an African-American Literary Canon, Aesthetic and Political Perspectives. And uh, I'm very happy that you're here and I'm looking forward to asking you many questions after you're done. <laughs> so the floor is now yours and uh, thank you for, um, thank you everybody for coming over. All right. Uh, thank you, Amélie, for uh, this introduction. So first, I would like to thank Amélie Maco, Pascal Antonin, as well, and as, well as uh, Laboratoire Climat for the invitation to be with you today. On this occasion, I'll be talking about my upcoming book, which will be released by Sorbonne Université Press in May 2025, if all goes according to plan. For the time being, there is still no title for the book, so if an idea randomly pops into your head at some point, uh, feel free to share at the end of the presentation. So, what makes uh, a work of literature a great work? This is a very simple question, yet it has stolen literary critics and literary historians for a very long time. Some claim that texts in the canon stand out on the virtue of their inherent literary and political and, and aesthetic qualities. Sorry, others believe that literary quality is not inherent; that it is socially and politically constructed, and that literary canons should be deconstructed and open up to new texts whose value has been initially misestimated or misunderstood. The goal of my research was certainly not to provide a definitive answer to this endless debate. In fact, in spite of the disagreement between literary historians and whether they want to defend or to deconstruct a canon, it shows that they essentially agree on the existence of a canon. So my interest was rather in assessing how concretely canons were built. What were the steps leading to canonicity? How did a poem, a play, a short story, a novel become a classic? How did it become a canonical work? To answer this question, I chose the African-American canon as a case study. This implied a focus on literary works which had been elevated to the pinnacle within the African-American culture and not within uh, the American culture at large. Of course, African-American texts uh, can also have a central place in the American uh, literary canon, but this was simply not the angle of my research. Uh, Sorry, uh, I focused on two types of publications, magazines and anthologies. I worked on 10 magazines and 56 anthologies published during the Harlem Renaissance, the 1920s and 30s, and uh, the Black Arts Movement, the 1960s and 70s. One of the bases for my reflection was to consider magazines as the starting point in the canon formation process. Indeed, many uh, literary works were initially published in a magazine before being possibly reprinted in anthologies. Part of my objective was to determine the influence of this initial publication on the path to canonization. 
To give you a better idea of uh, what I worked from, uh, a few words about the composition of my corpus. I included magazines uh, which had very different outlooks. There were monthlies, quarterlies, even a yearly, as well as magazines which were published irregularly or which stopped after a single issue. Some sold nationally, others issued no more than 300 copies. Some were the result of local writing workshops, while one was backed by a large publishing house. Most were sold, and one of them was distributed for free. Because these magazines published mostly poems, short stories, plays, and excerpts from novels, these are the four genres that I studied exclusively. If I was able to uh, maintain a numerical balance between magazines published uh, during the Harlem Renaissance and those uh, published during the Black Arts Movement, this was impossible to do for anthologies uh, for reasons which will be explained. For the Harlem Renaissance, I was able to study nine anthologies out of the 11 which could have been included, so 82% uh, for the period 1922-1937. And for the Black Arts Movement, it represented 45 volumes out of the 81 possible, so 55% for the period 1961-1976. On top of that, two extra anthologies were added, The Negro Caravan, published in 1941, and an autumn anthology of African American literature, published in 1997. The choice to add these two uh, volumes was connected to the very notion of a literary canon. Both were considered uh, the anthology par excellence of their time and provided an insight into the sedimentation of works in the literary tradition. So my idea was that the various prints and reprints give an idea of the works at the heart of the African-American literary tradition, just like the present the presence of certain authors, one volume after another, suggests their centrality in the canon. With the double periodization, including the Harlem Renaissance and the Black Arts Movement, it is possible to catch how the literary consensus could shift from one time to another, and to assess how stable the tradition actually is. Canon formation is a cumulative and participative process. Cumulative because it is fueled by successive individual judgments, and participative because these judgments eventually clump together until they form the contours of a collective judgment. My research points at this fundamental intersection between individual acts and collective results. Hence the intersection which will be dissected today, what is the effect of short-term practices on long-term processes? In other words, how does history affect literary value, or how is history inscribed in the literary texts? I will tackle the ways in which an African-American literary canon uh, took form in the 20th century, and assess how it has been shaped by a symbolic tug of war between uh, literary and political factors. The political dimension of writing is sometimes perceived through the emphasis uh, on certain themes, the denunciation of social ills, uh, the explicit connection made between uh, what is supposed to be imaginary situations and real life events. My first part will take those aspects in consideration. Secondly, I wish to imply also that the political uh, dimension is already at work with the very format of books and with the editorial policies undergirding the publication of any volume. Magazine editors and anthologists always engaged in editorial performances, both delineating the subjective contours of African-American literature and, in the final analysis, formatting a marketable African-American identity. My third part will deal with the dynamics at play in terms of preservation of literary works, both the avenues chosen and the roads not taken, and the difficulties which arise when making a literary concept the object of historical inquiry. In 1916-1917, when sociologist E. Franklin Frazier taught at the Tuskegee Institute, quote, he was told by the director of the academic department to stop walking across the campus with books under his arms because white people passed through the campus and would get the impression that the tu that Tuskegee Institute was training the Negro's intellect rather than his heart and hand, end quote. This anecdote suggests that the relationship between African Americans and anything related to writing has often been seen as troublesome and worrying for white America. The fact that teaching enslaved people how to read and write uh, was criminalized in most states, or the fact that during segregation, many libraries refused to admit African Americans only serve as further evidence. <laughs> 
So much so that cultural historian Ross Posnock maintained that black literacy has always been seen in the US as a, quote, disturbance, end quote, of the social, political, and by extension, literary order. Thus, it is no surprise that African-American authors were always keenly aware of the political potential associated with literature. In the preface of the anthology The Book of American Negro Poetry, published in 1922, the poet and anthologist James Weldon Johnson stated, quote, A people may become great through many means, but there is only one measure by which its greatness is recognized and acknowledged. The final measure of the greatness of all peoples is the amount and, stu and standard of the literature and art they have produced. The world does not know that a people is great until that people produces great literature and art. No people that has produced great literature and art has ever been looked upon by the world as distinctly inferior. End quote. Besides being the very first African-American literary anthology published in English, the Book of American Negro Poetry virtually kick-started the efforts to build the literary tradition. It set both the tone and standard to emulate for subsequent volumes. It also implied the interlacing between literary activity and a form of collective nationalist emancipation. Johnson's sentiment was echoed by other writers and intellectuals and intellectuals at the time, such as Alan Locke or W.E.B. Du Bois. For instance, in Du Bois's essay, The Criteria of Negro Art, published in October 1926, in a magazine, The Crisis, that he edited for the NAACP, he said, quote, All art is propaganda and ever must be, despite the wailing of the purists. I stand in utter shamelessness and say that whatever art Whatever art I have for writing has been used always for propaganda, for gaining the right of black folk to love and enjoy. I do not care a damn for any art that is not used for propaganda. End quote. Both the NAACP and the National Urban League were civil rights organizations which had turned into genuine patrons of the literary arts through the publication of their respective magazines, The Crisis and Opportunity. In other words, both magazine editors and anthologists perceived the political potential of literature in the fight against oppression. Because they were willing to weaponize literature in this fight, compliance with this goal was the preferred option for many African-American authors who wanted to get their material printed, especially since publishing opportunities were few and far between. Thus, this production paradigm actively contributed to shape the contours of the African-American literary canon. If black authors of the 60s and 70s had more editorial opportunities available, African-American literature somehow remained tied to the political fights of the day. Indeed, it was under the pressure of African-American students on various campuses uh, that universities across the country created the first black studies department in 1968. American publishing houses soon realized the potential new market, which had just been opened by the creation of this new discipline. To give you an idea, only a handful of African-American literary anthologies had been published between 1941 and 1967. Yet, more than 40 were published in the seven years between 1968 and 1974. Once again, the publishing tempo had been dictated by political mobilizations. Besides, although these departments came from a common political impetus, they emerged under a wide variety of labels. They were called Africana Studies, Black Studies, Black American Studies, Afro-Caribbean Studies, Afro-American Studies, Pan-African Studies, Ethnic and Third World Studies, etc. The fragmentation of perspectives ricocheted in the way anthologies were assembled. Since most anthologies were designed to be used as textbooks in classrooms, the various denominations adopted by black studies departments encouraged anthologies to expand, reduce, or twist a little further the perimeter of the African-American literary tradition. Indeed, about a fourth of all anthologies explicitly refer to students or studies, showing that providing material fit to be discussed directly within classrooms was a recurring concern for anthologists. This educational concern was present even before black studies departments, departments appeared, as some of these examples show. During the Harlem Renaissance, the magazine's opportunity and the crisis already oriented the production of a certain type of texts. 
They framed what was deemed acceptable literature by publishing, for instance, texts which stayed away from black dialect or dealt with uplifting themes. Because anthologists geared their book to a school audience, they further restricted uh, the text likely to get reprinted. Quote, the purpose of this volume is not to present another anthology of Negro literature, but to offer for classroom study of supplementary readings, a selection of types of writings by Negro authors. No apology, therefore, is made for the exclusion of writings of intrinsic worth, yet not wholly suitable for textbook adoption. End quote. Playwright and anthologist Willis Richardson made it even clearer in his 1930 anthology. In making selections, then, one play had to be put aside because it contained too much dialect, another because the question of sex came too much to the fore, another because the characters were such that to come within hearing distance of them was to be shocked by an unpleasant odor, and still another because its subject matter would cause more confusion in the minds of the youthful than a quarrelsome white woman in an hour house. End quote. We will come back on the subtle and not so subtle misogyny which appeared at different turns in uh, the building of a tradition. It would be tempting to dismiss these two examples as merely reflecting the politics of respectability, which was then in vogue in the black community. The African-American political mobilizations of the 60s and 70s did give way to a more unapologetic, un unapologetic tone. Still, African-American literature, on the whole, remains seen as one of the avenues in the political struggle for collective emancipation. In other words, even in the 60s, works of literature which were concerned with the politics of today had a better chance of getting studied in university classrooms. After all, it was only in keeping with the very logic which had led to the creation of black studies departments. As magazine editors and anthologists frequently emphasized, either directly or indirectly, most African-American texts had to contain a political dimension in order to be printed and then reprinted. On top of that, African-American texts also had to fit the narrow bill of material fit for classrooms. If these two conditions, uh, political dimension and classroom suitability, uh, were met by a substantial number of texts, it nevertheless opens the question of how literary exploration and innovation fared in the construction of a canon. Let's take the example of the poem Sometimes by Rhonda Davis, published in the magazine Negro Digest in 1969. Sometimes, when I got something on my mind, I'm not sure whether I be saying it or just be thinking it. And when people around me start talking about what I'm thinking about, I'm not sure if they heard it or felt it. Sometimes I be thinking so hard I think people's, people must hear my mind move just like sometimes they see my lips do the same thing. Besides, uh, briefly, sorry, <laughs> Davis emphasized the close relationship between hearing, saying, and seeing. The proliferation of the letter H, which was supposed to be pronounced, uh, makes the reading quite difficult and one has almost no choice but to say the poem aloud if they want to understand what is at stake. By inviting us to read aloud the poem to understand it, Davis emphasized the idea that poetry, and by extension literature, could set both minds and bodies in motion towards social change. After its initial publication, the poem was never reprinted in the anthologies I studied. Whether it was the result of anthologists uh, privileging works with proper grammar, proper syntax, and proper spelling, or not, remains unclear. Likewise, black American authors sometimes explored literary aspects which were harder to reconcile with the emerging African American literary tradition. Here is the example of the poem Hashtag by Norman Pritchard, and this time you can read it on your own. I guess you are done reading. Uh, so here is a poem which drops the linguistic dimension of poetry and prefers a typographic organization so as to convey meaning. The letter Z is multiplied in order to form a giant A across 26 lines. So pre precisely as many lines as there are letters in the alphabet. As such, Pritchard probably invited readers to reflect over the notions of, begin of beginning and end. A first reading of the poem could point to the limits of language, which, ca which cannot convey meaning as shapes and images can. A second reading could be the emphasis on the cyclical nature of things, where opposites succeed one another, overlap, and eventually blend into one another. A third reading could highlight the idea that out of an isolated multitude can emerge a coherent and powerful whole. 
A fourth reading could simply hint at the, at the biblical proverb that the last will be first and the first will be last. The very title of the poem, Hashtag, invites the reader to multiply the potential interpretations. In any case, if on the surface it can appear difficult to tie Pritchard's poem to the rest of the African-American literary tradition, with all these readings in mind, it is possible in many different ways. Yet, there is no doubt that this kind of poem is not exactly what a reader expects when opening a magazine or an anthology publishing African-American literature. So now is the time uh, to take a closer look at how format has had an impact on the shape of an African-American literary canon. In 1942, the academic Addison Hibbert reflected on the connection between magazines and anthologies. My bad. Quote, uh, the modern magazine is only an anthology, a selection made by an editor from the miscellaneous contributions brought to his desk. Anthologies of verse or pr and prose are the hour and the face of time, even as the magazine is the second hand." End quote. The analogy between these publications and the hands on the face of a clock is a useful one, even though it needs to be refined. Indeed, the word anthology is commonly used to refer to an editor's compilation of texts by various authors into a single volume. However, there are two types of books which would fit the description anthologies and miscellanies. Anthologies are designed to cover the entirety of a literary tradition, providing a diachronic perspective. Miscellanies are supposed to merely gather works that are essentially contemporaneous, providing a synchronic selection. This distinction is uh, more theoretical than historical, since most publishing houses and anthologists did not bother making it. For instance, the volume Black Fire, an anthology of Afro-American writing, which was edited in 1968 by Amiri Baraka and Larry Neal, was actually a miscellany in spite of its very subtitle. Thus, Hibbard's analogy would need to be updated. Anthologies are indeed the hour, the hour hand on the face of a clock, but miscellanies are the minute hand and magazines are the second hand. With this image, it becomes clear that each of these publications has a distinct role to play in canon formation, even though they ultimately function in synergy. A part of my book is devoted to tracing the movement of literary works from one publication to another, from one type of medium to another, in other words, from the more ephemeral to the more perennial. If each of these media entails a different chronological scope for its selection, I also found that this goes hand in hand with a different geographical scope. Magazines tend to emphasize a local identity or a local anchoring, while anthologies want to assume a national perspective. Miscellanies usually sit somewhere in the middle, as you can see it. The titles of anthologies strongly suggest a national or continental scope, while for magazines the local perspective can usually be perceived in the editorials or the ads carried. Magazines, and to some extent miscellanies, could proudly exhibit their local color or, on the contrary, an internationalist or pan-Africanist dimension. They published, uh, publica they published contributions by non-African American authors who came from virtually all over the world. Aimé Césaire and Léon Contradamas, Chinese-American playwright Frank Chin, South African poet Kira Rapitze William Kuzitzile, or Sierra Leonean poet Gladys Casely Hayford. Likewise, the subject matter of works could celebrate heroes and major events from what was then considered the Third World. Mm -hmm. Celebrations of Ho Chi Minh, Kwame Nkrumah, Jomo Kenyatta, Amilcar Cabral, or the Sharpeville Massacre in South Africa. Yet, all of these voices and texts focusing on uh, anything which took place in the third world uh, were left out of anthologies. Consciously or unconsciously, editors of anthologies emphasized a strictly national perspective through their selection. The very format of the book called for a restrictive and normative African-American identity to be displayed. James Weldon Johnson's uh, intuition that literature was inherently connected to a form of nationalism proved extremely resilient. In this regard, magazines, miscellanies, and anthologies all delivered variations in the editorial performance of a collective identity. <laughs> 
Since the contours of an identity are constantly fluctuating over time, it is only logical that the contours of an African-American canon have been fluctuating as well. In the 60s and 70s, the issue of format and how it affects publication developed in other ways. Indeed, several independent African-American publishing houses were set up during this period, mostly in the Midwest area. Broadside Press in Detroit, Lotus Press also in Detroit, Third World Press in Chicago, or Freelance Press in Cleveland. Broadside Press uh, was probably the largest and the most active, and it worked hard to disseminate literature for as little cost as possible. Most of the books published were paperbacks and sometimes looked like simple notebooks. Poetry collections sold for $1 or $1.50, and readers could also buy their favorite poem printed uh, on what we call a broadside sheet, accompanied by an illustration for a few cents, as you can see here. This proved extremely popular, both in terms of sales. The poet Donnell Lee sold approximately 80,000 copies of his poetry collections uh, with Broadside. And in terms of influence, since other independent African-American publishing houses soon imitated Broadside's business model. These editorial choices, however, had two major impacts on the canonization of African-American literature. First, the inexpensive and rather perishable format projected the idea that the literature it contained was not worth much either. In 1969, poet Brooks and, uh, poet Gwendolyn Brooks, who had won the Pulitzer Prize in 1950, decided to change publishers after five books published by Harper. She decided to be published by Broadside Press instead. In her case, the critics and anthologists remained more interested in the work she had published with Harper than in what she was publishing with Broadside. Likewise, poet Nikki Giovanni published her third poetry collection with Broadside Press in 1970. In the meantime, the publishing house William Morrow and Company collected her first two poetry collections, which had been self-published, in a new volume. Even though uh, Giovanni's third collection sold very well with Broadside, it was the release of the William Morrow and Company volume which dramatically increased her literary recognition. This leads to the second impact that can be illustrated uh, by the case of Tom Dent, who was one of the editors of the magazine Encombo, published in New Orleans, and the head of the company Free Southern Theatre. Between 1969 and 1972, uh, he urged the magazine Negro Digest, also based in the Midwest in Chicago, uh, to send critics to review the plays he put on with his acting troupe in order to get some media coverage. The magazine agreed to publish an account of the plays, but members of the Free Southern Theater had to write the critique themselves. What happened outside of the Midwest simply did not attract as much critical attention. What happened uh, on the geographical periphery was considered de facto peripheral literature. Ironically, the same thing happened for African-American literature as a whole. Indeed, Toni Morrison, who worked uh, as an editor for Random House from the late 1960s to the early uh, 1980s, once confided that 80% of the books sold in the US are sold within a 300 mile radius of New York City. The establishment of independent publishing houses in the Midwest had the consequence of shifting the editorial center of gravity for African-American literature. It became no longer aligned with the American editorial center of gravity, which was in New York. As a consequence, the book published in the Midwest did not attract the same critical attention as they might have done if they had been published in New York City. Literary value could be suggested much more by the place where work was produced than by the actual text. If the format of the media publishing literature had an impact on what got printed and reprinted, anthologists themselves also played a crucial role in that process. Indeed, anthologists frequently argued for the inclusion or the exclusion of certain authors, a decision based on criteria that ranged from understandable to fairly twisted logic. In many cases, early works from the 18th and 19th centuries were dismissed because, uh, because they were perceived as having a historical importance rather than a literary one. Uh, 
For instance, here is poet and anthologist Robert Hayden arguing that, quote, the poetry of Phyllis Wheatley and her fellow poet Jupiter Hammond has historical and not literary interest for us now, end quote. While James Emanuel and Theodore Gross uh, claimed in Dark Symphony in 1968 that, quote, the criterion for inclusion is the intrinsic artistic merit of the story, the poem, or the historical essay. We have reached the moment in our history when it becomes possible and indeed necessary to designate which works by Negroes deserve to be part of the heritage of American literature." End quote. Yet, even when the subjective uh, criterion of literary quality was met, some anthologists resisted the inclusion of certain authors based on dubious reasons. The case of Frank Yerby is quite eloquent. After writing for little African-American magazines in the 30s and 40s, he enjoyed considerable commercial success and to a degree critical acclaim with his novels, mostly historical fictions. However, the inclusion of his works, uh, of his works to anthologies was often a matter of debate because his fiction rarely portrayed African-American characters, if at all. So much so that when uh, the anthologists Richard Boxdale and Kenneth Kinneman analyzed the career of Chester Himes in their volume Black Writers of America in 1972, they declared, quote, if Himes sustains his present, present rate of output, he may become the black Yerby, end quote. In other words, it was suggested that being African-American was not automatically sufficient to be considered as part of the African-American tradition. The rejection of certain authors was, uh, was not always that explicit. In the case of Richard Bruce Nugent, his contributions were avoided by anthologists throughout most of the 20th century, probably because his name was connected to the, to the first openly homoerotic text published by an African American in a magazine Fire in 1926. Even though his literary legacy has been re-evaluated and uh, hailed by queer studies over the past few decades, Nugent's openly gay texts were not welcome at a time when anthologists tried to project a normative and collective African-American identity. This tacit rejection of homosexuality would also help explain why the novel Giovanni's Room by James Baldwin was never accepted by anthologists. The novel had the double disadvantage of featuring a white narrator and an almost all-white cast, while also dealing with issues connected to bisexuality or uh, homosexuality. In other words, for a very long time, intersectionality was not in vogue when it came down to canon formation. By tracing what works are included or excluded in successive anthologies, it becomes possible to get a fair picture of the larger trends at work in canon formation processes. One element is particularly striking, the gender distribution of contributors depending on the type of medium. Here, unidentified authors were essentially authors who signed with only their initials, uh, who signed with a Swahili or Yoruba name, or those who had the gender neutral name. As you can see, while women represented 31.5% of all contributors for the magazines uh, in my corpus, this percentage dropped to 29.2% for anthologies. At the same time, the proportion of male contributors jumped by 7% between magazines and anthologies, and this was due to the presence of biographical information in anthologies, uh, which, was, uh, which were most of the time absent uh, in magazines. These figures, uh, as such, already suggest the misogynistic current at work when editing an anthology. However, these figures don't show that four volumes in my corpus featured only female authors because female anthologists had grown fed up of seeing the work of women excluded. So, if we are just to take this fact into consideration, the overall proportion of women in anthologies drops to 26.8%, creating a 5% gap between magazines and anthologies. Analyzing the statistical recurrence of works or authors in certain media can provide valuable insights into the way canons are assembled. In this case, it only confirms what many people would otherwise have guessed. There has been a systematic bias against the work of women. In other cases, statistical recurrence can also dispel some preconceived notions we might have about the canon. For instance, it is completely wrong to assume that anthologies do nothing but always print and reprint the same works. In fact, 
75% of all the works printed in an anthology never get reprinted in another similar volume. Only 13% of the works are reprinted twice, and a work has less than a 2% chance to get reprinted five times. I would contend that these data suggest two things. First, the contours of the African-American literary canon are clearly both changing and changeable. Very few works have attracted a substantial amount of critical consensus. Second, this also points to the fundamental vitality of the African-American literary tradition, which remains constantly fueled by new works. And this begs the question of what to preserve and how to preserve. The magazine Black Opals, published in 1927-1928, is quite confidential. Its longest critical account is three pages long, and it is part of a chapter from the book Propaganda and Aesthetics, published in 1979. In this account, it is said that there were three issues of the magazine before it folded. A second account was given of the magazine in the Encyclopedia of the Harlem Renaissance, published in 2004. The second account covered a little less than a page, and it also mentioned the three issues of the magazine. When I did my research at the Schomburg Center in Harlem, I asked to have a look at the copies of the, of the magazine. I was quite surprised when I discovered that actually there had been four issues released. This discrepancy could be seen as a result of an honest and innocuous mistake, which it probably is. But it is also extremely telling. In the 80 years after the publication of the, of the magazine, very few scholars had bothered to go have a look at its contents. In the 25 years between the publication of Propaganda and Aesthetics and the Encyclopedia of the Harlem Renaissance, virtually no one took an interest in this magazine. In no likelihood, the, the writing of the second account was based on the first one. In other words, Black Opals was not offered a re-evaluation in 2004. It was simply a little more encrusted in the first major critical assessment which had been made of it in the 1970s. And this is a fundamental dynamic of canon formation that my research laid bare. Just like scholars in this case, anthologists tend to rely on previous volumes when assembling their own book. As a result, they indirectly rely on their predecessors' literary and aesthetic judgment to provide a newer, a newer version of the best works of African-American literature. As a consequence, there is a gigantic dormant archive composed of thousands of texts which may or may not have been properly assessed when they first came out. One could assume that this wealth of material, which is untapped, is mostly made of poor texts. Literary works which did not receive critical attention then because they simply did not deserve it. This could be part of the answer, but the reality is perhaps a bit more complex. For instance, a lot of works and authors were highly praised in their own time. The magazine's crisis and opportunity set up literary prizes in the mid-1920s. Most of the works which received a prize have fallen into complete oblivion, as this table shows. Between parentheses is the number of times uh, a work was reprinted in an anthology. Those in blue never were. Those in yellow were reprinted at least five times. Even for authors who received multiple prizes in green, uh, it was not a guarantee of literary survival. Uh, into this category, you had Eulalie Spence and Eugene Gordon. Eugene Gordon also edited from 1928 to 1930 the small magazine The Saturday Evening Quill, published in Boston. In the 1930s, he had the project of editing a short story anthology. He had selected all the works which would be reprinted, and the preface of the volume had been written by Edward J. O'Brien, a famous writer and editor of the time. In 1915, uh, O'Brien had launched the anthology series called The Best American Short Stories, which releases uh, a, new, uh, a new volume each year up to this day, and over the years, guest editors of the anthology have included Joyce Carol Oates, John Updike, Margaret Atwood, Stephen King, Salman Rushdie, or more recently, Roxanne Gay. Gordon's anthology project never materialized. Had this book been published, one can imagine that Gordon's literary works, as well as his role as magazine editor, would have garnered, perhaps, a little more critical attention. However, speculating on Gordon's potential literary fame is somehow beside the point. 
When it comes down to canon formation, what matters is what remains. To leave a mark on the tradition, one needs to leave a trace first. Hence, the difficulty encountered to, by African-American authors and anthologists in having merely access to a publishing house has to be factored in the analysis of canon formation. Black authors lived in a society where the vice president the vice president of an important publishing house could casually rem remark in the 1960s that, quote, the demand for black literature is not there, and furthermore, we don't know of any good writings by blacks, end quote. In spite of the commercial and critical success of authors such as James Baldwin, Ralph Ellison, Lauren Hensbury, Richard Wright, or Gwendolyn Brooks, to name just a few. Prosaically, getting access to publication is covering half the way to canonization. So when the success has been denied or restrained because of, a, of the historical and political weight of segregation, we can legitimately raise questions on the validity of previous literary and aesthetic evaluations. The other half of the way to canonization is preservation, both material and in collective memory. In the African-American case, one of the first obstacles is the fact that there is a strong tradition of oral literature. The transcription of a song in an anthology can never account for its circulation within the larger African-American culture. The same thing goes for drama. Drama is what French literary critic Henri Gouillet has described as a two-step art form, un art de temps, where the composition of the work precedes the performance of the work. In my research, it was impossible to locate all the traces, if any, left by the multiple performances of plays. A statistical analysis of canon formation processes is invariably lacking insofar as it can only account for the material circulation of literary works within a social and geographical space. Yet, I would contend that, it's, that a statistical analysis also helps to understand the importance of what I call symbolic preservation, that is to say, the practices and discourses likely to have an impact on the visibility of a novel, a poem, or a play in a given culture. Material preservation of literary works may seem the most obvious form of preservation. Either books are stored in libraries and research centers, or they are simply reissued in, new, uh, in a new edition and sold. These two avenues for preservation can appear diametrically opposed. Storage implies uh, the immobility of copies, while sales suggest their circulation. But we could also see it as quite complementary. Symbolic preservation operates on another level, that of literary works themselves. <coughs> Authors frequently celebrate the work of their peers through intertex intertextual references. This intertextuality can, at times, boost the visibility of certain literary works. I will take the example of Paul Lawrence Dunbar, who is one of the central poets in the African-American literary tradition, to bring this presentation to a close. His works have been uh, reprinted countless times, but with a statistical analysis, it becomes possible to probe the way a critical consensus was acquired for two of his poems, Sympathy and We Wear the Mask. As this table shows, at first, these two poems were not particularly present in the 20s and 30s, being reprinted only in one volume, Caroling Dusk, in 1927. Anthologists apparently preferred to publish other works by Dunbar instead of these two poems. However, in the late 1960s, when the flow of anthologies became way more important, either one of the two or both poems were reprinted in almost each anthology that featured Dunbar's work. The volume Soul Script in 1970 reprinted only one poem by Dunbar, and it was We Wear the Mask, which was chosen to better represent Dunbar's contribution. Same thing goes for the volume Write On, only this time it was Sympathy, which was reprinted. For the volume Black Voices in 1968, only four poems by Dunbar appeared, but these two were included. How come anthologists in the 20s and 30s generally chose not to reprint those two poems? when anthologists in the 60s and 70s apparently could not assemble their volume without either one or the other in it. Part of the answer may become apparent when reading Sympathy. I have highlighted two lines from this poem that you may recognize from somewhere else. Indeed, Maya Angelou chose this line for the title of her autobiography published in 1969. 
Her book became an immediate bestseller, and it directly contributed into shining a new light on the poem. For the case of We Wear the Mask, the situation is slightly different, but essentially similar. Indeed, in the 1960s, the metaphor of the mask immediately conjured the writings of Franz Fanon. His book, The Wretched of the Earth, had been translated for the American market in 1963, and his second book, Black Skin, White Masks, had also been translated in 1967. The influence of Fanon's writing was huge on African-American activists. By 1970, Fanon had sold around 750,000 copies of his books in the US. In the words of Dan Watts, editor of the magazine Liberator, quote, every brother on a rooftop can quote Fanon, end quote. Thus, no effort was required to symbolically bridge the gap between the poet and the psychiatrist. Despite the passing of time, Dunbar's work remained aesthetically relevant because, in part, it was politically modern. In the thickness of the Black Archive, the road which led these two poems to become canonical had remained undiscernible for generations. And I believe it is our role as scholars to trace new roads which might expand our literary and aesthetic horizons. Thank you.